contractors of outcome after TKR, the unhappy knee. Thank you, chairpersons. A um, bit of a change of pace from all the hip talks we've had. Um, so every meeting I go to, and most journals, we talk about dissatisfaction rate in, hip, in knee replacements. And we keep on quoting about 20%. But surely knee replacements work. We all know they work. Here's a couple of examples of patients with happy knees. So what's, what's this all, the, all this talk about the unhappy knee? We've got a lot of evidence showing the benefits of knee replacements. But there's a final bit of patient, a final uh, group of patients who are not as satisfied. And I guess that inspired what I'll call the pursuit of happiness. And that inspired me to uh, engage in a PhD study to look into what, what makes a happy knee a happy knee. What makes it tick? What is happiness? I think the guy on the left will do well with a knee replacement. He'll be very happy. The lady on the right might be a little bit more grumpy with you. Is it surgeon rated? Is it based on our field? Ligament balance, gap balancing. This feels like a really good knee. I think the patient will be happy. Or is it, as we've heard, all about getting mechanical alignment? Or in fact, maybe it's all about kinematic alignment or constitutional alignment. Is it about improvement in PROMS? So improvement in OKS and the Oxford Knee Score and WOMAC and so on. Or is it just about doing solid, good surgery that's complication free, getting the patient back to work, back to function? We're recently, we're, there's more focus on the touchy-feely stuff, patient satisfaction, patient success. What's that all about? Well, we know that surgeon-rated success is completely different from what the patient wants. We don't focus on what they want. They're more interested in return to function and functional activities that we don't consider when we put in a knee replacement. In fact, our judgment is probably no more than a flip of a coin in terms of whether we think a patient is going to achieve satisfactory improvement in their uh, scores. So I must acknowledge Dr. Sorrell here because he allowed me access to his uh, personal database of knee replacements. This is one of my projects where we studied 473 knee replacements in 459 patients. We had the usual breakdown in demographics. They all had their preoperative alignment assessed, and postoperatively they all had what we call a CT scan according to the Perth protocol established by uh, uh, Sikorsky from Perth. This was uh, assessing component orientation in 14 degrees, 14 different measurements. And again, when you come to look at our breakdown of our patient, they had the usual, um, the usual alignment of uh, various predominantly, followed by uh, some that were in valgus and some in neutral rotation. When we look at how they behaved afterwards, we can also see how they ended up. And if you believe in kinematic alignment, well then there's a problem in these couple of groups where they swung from a various alignment to a valgus alignment, completely unnatural to that person or vice versa, from a valgus alignment to a various alignment. Right? I was really tough here. I only counted somebody to be in neutral alignment if they were within plus or minus one degree. Because I really wanted to capture the cream of the crop and see how they compared to the rest. And we uh, measured their femoral um, alignment, component alignment in all planes, uh, tibial component alignment, rotation, and so on. And as you expect, all knee replacements, most patients tend to do better after a knee replacement. doesn't matter how you measure that. When you look at their preoperative uh, status, so what they started with, are we comparing apples to apples? Yeah, usually yes. The main difference really is uh, when you look at range of motion, the various group was slightly uh, worse off by seven degrees. But when you compare their postoperative alignment, they were completely the same. It didn't really matter. And when you put the two side by side, so the, the bars here are neutral, varus, and valgus alignment. You can look at their preoperative assessment and their postoperative alignment, and they pretty much do the same in terms of their performance. And then when you look at individual component orientation, again, no difference. Interestingly, the two groups, the swing groups, as I call them, from varus to valgus and vice versa, again, when you compare them, no difference. So I'm not sure about the kinematic alignment business. Now, I must give a big footnote and a big disclaimer here. This is assessing their performance over one year. It's nothing to do with their poly uh, assessment, poly wear, failure, revision. We, don't, we didn't assess that data. So does a good prom make somebody satisfied and successful? 
Or does, and can they predict each other? Well, it's probably more complicated than that. We've heard a lot of talks this week about different aspects, and satisfaction and success and a happy knee is probably not any one single thing. It's actually a combination of all of the above. Pathology, comorbidities, patient expectation. Of course, having a complication doesn't help. So I was uh, fortunate to be involved in a prospective uh, study funded by a, an insurance company where we studied uh, all hip and knee replacements from 19 different hospitals in six states in Australia. And I concentrated only on the knees. So we had over a thousand knees followed up prospectively for a year. We measured a lot of stuff. We, we got all their demographics and it's the usual breakdown that you see in multiple other things. We also looked at their all the uh, thought, the variables which we thought are important, so preoperative factors, demographics, and uh, their anesthetic uh, procedure, local anesthetic infiltration, spinal, neuraxial, blocks, GA, so on. We also looked at the type of prosthesis, cruciate retaining, cemented, uncemented, patella, all the usual stuff that we discuss. Drains, transfusion rates, cryotherapy, CPM, whether they had rehab afterwards, and of course we followed their journey for a year. So we recorded all their complication, regardless of how minor they were. We come to assess their outcomes in multiple different ways. UK prompts for satisfaction and success. To me, I rated the unsuccessful group as the bottom two in each. So when it came to satisfaction, it was the ones who rated their satisfaction as poor or fair. When it came to success, it's the ones who compared the results now to before the surgery as much worse or a little worse. And then I hypothesized that surely a happy knee would be both satisfied and successful. And we compared that with OKS and the European Quality of Life questionnaire. So interestingly, when you ask patients, are you satisfied with your knee replacement? Most say yes, only 7% rate of dissatisfaction. But more importantly, when you ask them, do you think your knee is successful? I think we get a more representative group, about double the rate of unhappiness, I guess. They don't rate their knee as being very successful, 14%. And interestingly, in my hypothesis, you should be satisfied on success, probably didn't make a difference. So my most appropriate question seems to be, do you think your knee is successful, rather than do, are you satisfied with your knee? Then we did some clever statistical work, and we found out that the things that predicted that rate of satisfaction are presented over here. So bilaterals did better, but I think there's a big selection bias here. Bilaterals are done in patients who are more disabled, so they're going to be happier with the knee replacement. They're more motivated, they're usually younger, have no comorbidities, so they're basically the up and go kind of population. And the reverse can be applied to our compensation patients who really don't want to go very far at all. But interestingly, Physi physiological issues do have an impact. So heart disease, sleep apnea, ASA of three or four did make a significant contribution and prosthesis design. PS did better than CR. Doing the patella did better than not doing the patella. And of course, complications don't help. So I just want to leave you with some odds ratios. Compensation, terrible, right? 11 times the rate of developing an unhappy knee. Things like uh, sleep apnea, interestingly, almost the same as developing a complication. Same rate of, uh, sorry, same odds ratio for unhappiness. Whereas technical factor like doing patella, resurfacing it, neuraxial anesthesia and crochet retaining prosthesis, uh, sorry, cruciate sacrificing prosthesis seem to have that rate. And it's not just the touchy-feely stuff. If you look at the patient's journey here and you measure it with preoperative Oxford knee scores, 90 day, 365 day, they all show significant difference value for all of these is less than 0 0.001. And it's not just knee, it's actually quality of life. So if you look at the uh, quality of life, it's a significant difference between all groups, between both groups along all uh, different periods. And it really didn't matter how you measured it. So have I found out what makes a happy knee a happy knee? Eh, not really, but what I know now that it's not as simple as choosing your prosthesis or doing a particular type of anesthesia or technique. It's all very, uh, it's multifactorial, it's a lot more complicated than what we think. Thank you.